Do you, do you want me to go ahead then? Uh, no, uh, I will. Okay, let me do uh, just some announcement and, and do the introduction and then pass it to you. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the 24th talk from the PetroLearn at Home seminar series. Uh, I'm extremely sorry for the uh, slight delay today. Uh, actually, I mean, we had some technical problem and this talk since uh, Jim is in Australia, so we, we decided to change the time from 12 p.m. EDT to, to 10. So uh, just for, uh, for him to be able to uh, do the presentation before going to bed. What time is that in, in Australia, Jim? Oh, I'm a little past 10 p.m. here. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I really appreciate your flexibility to, to give this talk. Uh, so my name is Hamed Sarouj. I'm the CEO of PetroLearn, uh, and this is going to be our first talk in July. And as we announced before, uh, I mean, uh, we started the program uh, in, in April, and we have had 23 talks so far, and July will be the last, uh, basically, month of the program. Uh, so we will have, uh, apart from Jim's presentation, we have uh, five other uh, talks in, in July. Uh, and after July, we might have actually ad hoc talks, but uh, they will not be a, like a scheduled uh, uh, no, uh, uh, program like, like what we had in the last three, three four months. Uh, so uh, please make sure that uh, you follow us on LinkedIn uh, for updates on, on this uh, July program and also uh, for some announcement from our company. Uh, so the next uh, seminar would be on the 10th of July, uh, the coming Friday, uh, by Dr. Jeremy Boak from uh, uh, basically uh, uh, a state geologist uh, uh, who is an independent consultant. And he's going, going to talk uh, about uh, regulatory uh, utility of uh, models for induced seismicity. So, so the next talk is about seismicity. Uh, before introducing Jim, I would like to ask everyone to mute the microphones and turn off cameras. Uh, uh, if you have any question, please uh, use the chat box to write your questions. Jim will kindly answer as many questions as possible. If for any technical uh, and non-technical reason, you, you could not stay with us until the end of the presentation. Uh, so we will record the presentation and you will access to, to the presentation hopefully tomorrow uh, on our website. So uh, Jim Undershultz, uh, we had the pleasure actually to have a team, uh, Jim actually as our instructors while ago giving uh, courses on uh, hydrogeology. So with more than 30 years of experience and more than 100 publications on the subject, Dr. Undershultz uh, uh, has built a reputation in petroleum hydrogeology, uh, unconventional uh, hydrocarbon and carbon, uh, carbon storage research. He is currently president of uh, Petroleum Hydrogeology International uh, and is also an uh, honorary professor at the University of Queensland. His science leader storage for ANLEC R&D, chair of the geotechnical uh, reference group for the CTSCO, uh, if I pronounce it right, uh, CCS project, uh, and sits on the science advisory committee for the, for the Peter Cook Center for CCS uh, research. Previously, Jim was a uh, professorial chair of uh, petroleum hydro hydrodynamics at the University of Queensland. Uh, so he was also CSIRO team leader for the unconventional petroleum and geothermal energy R&D. He sat on the sustainable energy for a square kilometer array geothermal project uh, control group the Australian Mirror Committee of the ISO uh, for carbon capture and storage. And he managed the hydrodynamics and the geochemistry discipline group within the Australian Cooperative Research Center on CO2, CO2 uh, CRC. So recently, uh, Jim's research has focused on petroleum hydrodynamics of uh, faulted strata and the incorporation of the hydrodynamics into uh, seals analysis uh, 
His research has varied application to, un to conventional and conventional hydrocarbon, uh, geothermal energy, mining, and carbon storage. Tim's uh, presentation title today is Hydrocarbon Pressure, Free Water Level, Gas Water Context, and How They Link to Capillary Pressure. Why should I care? With that said, uh, Jim, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thanks very much, Hamid. That's a very big uh, introduction. I'll, um, <laughs> look, I, I thought it would be an interesting topic for uh, a lot of people. And I'd like to just say I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in and giving up part of their day. Um, I realize how busy everybody is. So I'll launch into, I'll launch into this talk. I, I thought it would be interesting because a lot of people are working in unconventional hydrocarbons these days. And, and um, sometimes we get a little bit rusty or forget about how some of the physics of multi-phase fluids operate in 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 uh, porous media and and even when we're in unconventional so I know I've you know I've done a lot in shale gas and and uh, coal seam gas here in Australia and there are situations that come up where suddenly these things become really important uh, and I thought it would be a, just an opportunity to just maybe just brush up a little bit and remind ourselves of some of these processes and and what to look for um, it's not always that it's really important, but sometimes it's really seriously important to look at these things. And it's really a matter of being aware of what to look for and when it's there, what should we do about it? So I'll launch into that. I just wanted to make sure just that everybody realized I was actually at University of Queensland um, for about six years with the Center for Coal Seam Gas there, the natural gas. And I'm now sort of semi-retired from that, but I'm still associated with the university there as an honorary professor and I've got some students there uh, that I'm still supervising trying to make sure they get through. Um, okay so what I wanted to do hopefully everybody can see my screen and uh, I'll use the mouse a little bit so hopefully there's not too big a delay. Um, we just go back to our kind of capillarity in high school physics a couple slides here. Um, capillarity of course is important any time that we have two-phase flow within a porous media uh, or multi-phase flow. Um, hydrocarbons, certainly within reservoir rocks, tend to be a non-wetting phase. That's, that's not always true, of course, with source rocks uh, where it can, you can swap. Um, the wettability, of course, uh, and how that behaves in the pore space relates to how we understand relative permeability. Uh, so how we parameterize our, our, our numerical models, it becomes really important. Um, and of course, capillarity is what allows oil and gas to be trapped in the subsurface by changes in rock permeability. And I've got here, just thinking back to your high school physics, you might have, uh, remember, you can have a beaker of water uh, with a test tube down inside that beaker of water, which is like, uh, represents perhaps like a small diameter pore throat in the subsurface. And what happens in that beaker of water is we've got a level of the water out in the beaker and capillarity, because the water is the wetting phase and there's a capillary pressure, pulls the water level inside the narrow diameter tube up to a higher elevation than it sits out in the beaker. And the meniscus, of course, is concave down and that's because the water wets the sides of the test tube. It really it likes to stick to the test tube sides and it, and it it moves up in the beaker. Now, if we compared that beaker with an equivalent beaker on the right of mercury, uh, I don't know, I can certainly remember mercury in thermometers, <laughs> um, the reverse would happen. So the meniscus is the opposite way. And because mercury is the non-wetting fluid, it doesn't want to make its way up inside that narrow diameter tube. And so the elevation of the fluid in the tube is below what is outside in the, uh, in the um, in the beaker. So you can imagine if you wanted to force the mercury up this test tube on the inside, you'd have to apply a force on the outside here. And if you push down on that, it would take some extra pressure to convince this mercury that it should go up inside the test tube. And for uh, a lot of cases in reservoir rocks in the subsurface, um, hydrocarbons behave as the non wetting phase. So that's just a little reminder. And on the right-hand side, of course, the surface, it's a surface area related. So we can see in this diagram for the exact same fluid, as the uh, test tube gets narrower and narrower, the capillary force brings the fluid higher and higher in the tube. Okay, 
So well, I just had to put this in as a disclaimer to say anything I say doesn't necessarily represent the University of Queensland. That's important for me to put that in there. We'll go away from that now. Okay. So there's um. Uh, so how does the capillary pressure and pressure in the in the hydrocarbon relate? Well, there's a fantastic paper if you have a chance to read this paper by Alton Brown back in 2003, where amongst a lot of other things, including some fault analysis type work, he describes exactly this, how, how capillary pressure relates to a hydrocarbon phase in the subsurface. And I've got a couple diagrams on the right-hand side of the screen um, where I've got a, a capillary pressure plot and uh, a bit of information on that. And the top plot would be a typical plot for a reservoir type rock. And the bottom plot would be a typical plot for a seal type rock or a lower, or maybe in a marginal quality reservoir or a lower permeability rock. So, so, and I borrowed some of the stuff that Alton talked about in his paper and just used that to recreate this diagram here. So what are the key aspects of this? Well, basically we've got on the vertical axis, increasing capillary pressure as we move vertically on that axis. And on the horizontal axis, we've got the wetting phase saturation from 0% to 100% on the right. And let's just assume that it's a water wet system. And so if we thought about having uh, a little core plug of reservoir rock, and it started off at 100% water saturation, we'd be over on the right hand side of this plot at the right hand bottom corner. Um, now, if that core plug was completely saturated with, uh, with water, and we wanted to then introduce a non-wetting phase into the core plug. So let's say some oil. Let's assume that was a non-wetting phase. In order to get the oil into the core plug, we've got to add a little bit of pressure. So that's increasing capillary pressure on this vertical axis. And um, let me just move this here. Um, so it turns out that for a reservoir rock, you don't have to add very much pressure to get the non-wetting phase in the case of oil into the, into the rock. And that very first point at which you get the first little bit of water, a little bit of oil into the pore space of the, of the rock is what we would call the entry pressure for the non-wetting phase. And in this case, case for a reservoir rock, the entry pressure is very close, almost indistinguishable from zero capillary pressure. And then as we move up this curve, we add a little bit, more. the more pressure we add to the non-wetting phase, we start to increase the saturation of the non-wetting phase. And so we move to the left on the plot and it goes from 100% water saturation to less and less water saturation. Now, right at this point here, we've got an inflection point that is called the threshold pressure or uh, some people call it the displacement pressure. So those two terms are interchangeable in the literature. You'll see some people refer to a displacement pressure. Some people call uh, a threshold pressure, that point there. So, and this brings us back to Alton's paper. The interesting thing, so the key point about this pressure is that's the point. Up until now, we've got some non-wetting phase in the pore space, but it's disconnect, disconnected little globules of non-wetting non phase. By the time we get to the threshold pressure or this displacement pressure, that's the point at which the non-wetting phase starts to form a continuous tendril through the pore space. It's still a fairly small percentage of the saturation, but once you get a continuous tendril forming, it means that you can start to transmit pressure within the non-wetting phase on a different pressure gradient than on the wetting phase. And that's really important. So this threshold pressure point is, is the key, that's the key point at which you start to get a continuous tendril of the non-wetting phase. And then as we increase the pressure again, uh, let me get my mouse going here. We continue, in the case of a reservoir rock, we go through this fairly flat part of the curve and with, without having to put too much pressure on, we, curve around to what we would call the irreducible water saturation. That's at this point here. So no matter how much extra pressure you add, you don't reduce the water saturation any more than that point. So, so how does this relate to what would be happening in a reservoir if we go to the right-hand side here? 
well, the interesting thing is, is that the difference between basically zero capillary pressure, which would be the free water level, and the threshold pressure, that's where the oil water contact would be. So the difference in there, in this case of the reservoir rock, there's not much difference. So you, the reality is in the reservoir, you might not see much difference in that. Um, but then between there and the point at which you reach irreducible water saturation at this capillary pressure here, that's what we would call the transition zone. So if you had a well that had a completion in that zone, you'd get commingled fluids being produced. And if you had your well uh, in above, completed above that, you would have water-free production up there. So the transition zone, so the interesting thing is, is if you know the density of your hydrocarbon phase and the water phase, and you know what the threshold pressure is, you could calculate how thick this transition zone would be. So that's useful information. So now, that, so those are the key aspects of how we link a capillary pressure curve back to what's happening in the reservoir. Um, now, if we compare a curve, typical curve for a reservoir rock on the top to that of a seal or a marginal quality reservoir, lower permeability reservoir on the bottom, we see a couple of big differences here. The first thing is that the entry pressure, the point at which you get the first bit of non-wetting phase into the pore space, you need to add a lot more pressure before you can get it in there. Uh, the second part is that this shape of this curve is a lot more of a lazy curve. It doesn't have this sharp horizontal bit here. So it means you end up with a thicker transition zone. And the third point is that the irreducible water saturation tends to be a lot higher than it is for a good quality reservoir rock. Okay, so those are the main components of that plot. And we're gonna talk about these components a lot through the rest of the presentation. So it's important to get those things straight. Okay, well, um, capillary pressure is something that we can actually measure in the laboratory. So the entry pressure here, the, uh, the, 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 that's the point at which the first bit of non-wetting phase would go into, uh, into, the, into the piece of rock is you can calculate that and it's just a function of uh, two times the lambda and lambda is the interfacial tension uh, multiplied by the contact angle and that's between the hydrocarbon and the water phase and then this rt term is the is the radii of the pore throat um, in, in, for, for that rock so we can actually calculate so if we have a piece of core uh, we can measure these things in the laboratory and get the capillary entry pressure. We can actually calculate that. Um, the problem is, is that to measure this, first of all, you gotta have some core, then you gotta send it to the laboratory. It's sort of time consuming and can be expensive to get those numbers. And if you do one or five or 10 measurements, you still have to wonder how representative is that of my entire reservoir. So there's always some uncertainty there. So um, is there some alternative way of looking, looking at these things? And there is, it turns out. So let's just go to the next diagram here. So it turns out that if you have a trap that's filled to its seal capacity or its capillary seal capacity, or you think that that trap is being controlled by capillary processes, whether it's a fault seal or a top seal capillary process, the, the threshold pressure of the seal is balanced by the upwards buoyancy pressure of the hydrocarbon column. So if you know the hydrocarbon column kite height and you know the density of the fluids, you can calculate the threshold pressure. So here, what we have is that the threshold pressure or PT is just equal to the difference in density between the, the wetting and non-wetting phase times the acceleration of gravity and multiplied by the height of the hydrocarbon column. So on the on the right hand side here, I've just got a little diagram of increasing pressure to the right and depth down a wellbore. And let's say here's our seal, this gray zone here. And let's say below that seal, we've accumulated a hydrocarbon column of a height that's equal to the point at which we reach the threshold pressure of the seal rock and it starts to leak or it's in balance with that threshold pressure. Well, if we, uh, if we look at this height of the hydrocarbon column, and remember this intersection point. So now we've got a water gradient in blue on this. I've got it as 9.81 kPa per meter, which is fresh water. So the water leg would be, because of the density of the, of the water, would be increasing on that pressure gradient there. 
And as we accumulate a hydrocarbon phase, because it's lighter, uh, lower density, we have something more like 2 kPa per meter. So what we can do is we compare those densities, those two phases, and we can calculate this difference here at the seal reservoir interface. And that, oh, don't, I'll just put this on here, the free water level is where these two gradients intersect, of course. So that's the free water level, and that's at zero capillary pressure. And this difference at the top is really the, would be the threshold pressure with the assumption that this hydrocarbon column is being controlled by the capillary seal capacity of the, of the trap. So that's another way of, of looking. And of course, this number is going to be something more of a bulk number that's controlling the entire reservoir size. So it's a little bit different view of the world than just doing a core plug measurement. Uh, so these two things can be complementary. So, but and I've just got on here uh, for, for the guys in the US, a few unit conversions. So one kPa per meter, what we're using in SI units would be something like 0 0.044 PSI per foot. The water gradient of 9.8 is something like 0.4337 at PSI per foot. And a gas gradient there would be something equivalent uh, of something like that if you're used to PSI per foot. So I'll just put that on for you. Okay. So, so this gets a little bit more, can get a little bit more complicated in the sense that, so now what I've got on the right-hand side here is I've got a typical capillary pressure plot again. This one here uh, with a solid black line would be for a reservoir type rock. And the dashed black line would be something more for a seal type rock. And again, on the left-hand side, again, I've got a pressure elevation or pressure depth plot where we've got increasing pressure across the horizontal axis and then going with depth on the vertical axis. I've got a seal marked here in the gray uh, zone. <coughs> and we've all got, got a, let's assume we've got a hydrocarbon column accumulated here with a free water level and a water gradient. Well, in this case, I've got the water gradient coming up like this um, and then a dashed line that just extends that through the seal into the zone above the seal, the next reservoir unit above. And here I'm assuming that the hydraulic head in the unit above is a little bit different, in this case lower. Uh, so the, the, the water gradient above the seal would be here. So somewhere between the top of the seal and the bottom of the seal, the pressure in the water phase has to get from this point to this point on this gradient here. So, and what gets interesting is through this section here of the hydrocarbon column where the relative permeability starts to drop and the water moldability drops. So, so let's just think about these things in terms of these cap pressure curves. So the first thing is, remember, is that the free water level or the intersection of these two gradients is at zero capillary pressure. So that's that point there. The, the next key thing is somewhere up here where we're getting close to higher in the hydrocarbon column, where we're approaching irreducible water saturation, we start to lose the, the mobility of the water phase within the pore space. So the water, the water saturation has dropped to something close to irreducible water saturation, and the relative permeability has dropped as well. So, the dis, so what we think probably happens is somewhere between there and the top of the seal, the water pressure has to go from this, the water gradient at the base of your pool to whatever the water gradient is above the seal. And the distribution of how that changes is completely dependent on the permeability to the water phase. So what's interesting is what I just told you before about looking at the hydrocarbon column height and thinking about the difference in density between the two phases times acceleration of gravity, that would give you this difference here in terms of what we would estimate as the threshold pressure. But a lot of people have started to wonder well, what about this little delta P in the water system and how big that is? Should we take that into account when trying to understand the threshold pressure? Um, and there's been a lot of work done on this over the last 10 years or so. And I don't have a lot of time in this presentation to talk about it, but there are a number of publications here that I can give you. I'll just give you a chance to jot some of those down if you want to look at those and of course there's references within within these and that really covers 
the result of uh, 10 or 12 years of people doing experiments and trying to understand is this a delta P really an important factor or not? Um, and of course, always the answer is never a clear answer. Uh, quite often it's not important, but occasionally it can be important. So um, if you're interested in that sort of nuances of that detail, um, I suggest you check out uh, a couple of these publications if you've got some time to do that. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna, what I'd like to do now is we've kind of covered some of the key aspects of capillary pressure plots and how that relates to hydrocarbon pressures in a reservoir. And what I'd like to do now is go and introduce you to a field example. So let's, let's just take, I came across this really cool field example here in Australia. It's on the Northwest shelf of Australia, about 62 kilometers offshore. Um, it's oil and gas production from a floating production storage and offloading facility. It was the, the Griffin field was discovered in 1989 and came into production in 1994. Um, there's sort of a, a cross section there of a seismic line. Uh, just to get you oriented a little bit, um, here's a map in this little uh, icon map in the bottom here is a map of the total of Australia. I'm in Perth uh, in Western Australia, about where my pointer is right now. And offshore Northwest shelf of Australia is this zoom in this is an area of a lot of gas production of course australia's uh, liquids poor we've got heaps of gas here but not a lot of oil or, or condensate so anytime we find a little bit of oil everybody studies the bejeebers out of it because we'd like to know how did that happen why did it happen and is there any more <laughs> so this particular field's had a lot of work done on it for that very reason because we've got oil so so this is the chinook Sindian, and griffin fields in this yellow dot here about 60 k's or so off offshore, the, the, the hydrocarbons are brought on so and processed at the coast. Uh, and in, on the left-hand side is a zoom in of the wells in this field. And you'll see there's two separate fields. The Cindy and Chinook field on the right-hand side or the east side has uh, two gas caps with an underlying, underlying oil rim. Uh, and then there's a water saturated part of the reservoir and to the west, we've got the Griffin field that's predominantly, uh, predominantly oil. Um, so you can see that there's a few uh, horizontal wells in there, a few vertical wells, and we've got reasonably good well control. There's also an interesting fault control. So this, this map is, um, is good in particular, looking at the Griffin field, you can see on the west side, it's a fault bound structure. Uh, and on the right hand side or the east side of the field, there's this other synthetic fault but the, the field actually is filled and spilled around the tip of that fault to the east side of the fault and it carries all the way down here and there's a well, Ramillies 1, in the south that intersects the oil column on the east side of that fault. So that's an interesting aspect of that, uh, of that field there. Let's just go ahead. Here's a little bit more detailed map. And the interesting thing here to point out is that uh, I've got a structure contour map on here. And the first thing is that the two gas caps in the Cindy and Chinook field have different gas oil contact elevations, uh, which is interesting, and they're disconnected. Um, the other thing is, is that the oil water contact for the Cindy and Chinook field is different, quite substantially different than it is for the Griffin field here. So one of the interesting things is that if we, look at the um, sort of the hydrocarbon fill spill. Well, the other thing that's, that's interesting is that I, I just wanted to point out again, those faults play a role. And the other thing is, is that we've got grains with oil inclusions or, or sort of these, these, these fluid inclusion data that would suggest that the paleo oil columns here are substantially larger than what the current oil columns were. Um, the history here is that the, the bulk of the hydrocarbon my generation migration happened roughly 70 or 80 million years ago. Uh, that migration occurred, it filled the traps, and then it, it sat there. And probably within the last you know, two to five million years, there was a change in tectonics where uh, this, this passive margin converted to a uh, basically subduction zone went under Timor, and it, and it converted to a convergent margin. 
And in that last few million years, it's jostled all the traps and uh, reoriented them a little bit with some tilting, but it's also created a lot of fault reactivation. And a lot of the fields in the Northwest Shelf of Australia, as you can see the structure there, but some of them have held their hydrocarbons and a lot of them has lo have lost part or all of the hydrocarbons. So an interesting story here is looking at this paleo oil columns and thinking about the structural geometry here of the fill spill. And you can see, if I look at the Cindy and Chinook field, basically this orange dot dotted line here would be the current spill out to the east. That would be a fair bit below the current oil uh, water contact. But then even deeper below that, you'll see this other set of dashed orange lines here. That would be the spill from Griffin into Cindy and Chinook and ultimately out of the trap to the east. And that fill spill is getting quite close to where we would say the original oil water contact would be based on the oil inclusions in, the, uh, in that GOI data. So there's some, some interesting stuff, what's happened to this trap over geological history. Anyway, we'll come back to that towards the end. For the time being, what I'd like to do is just compare these two uh, pools with a couple well examples. And I'll pick out Chinook 1 here, which is right at the top of the, uh, of, the, of the Chinook field there that includes both the gas cap and the underlying oil leg. And we'll take a look at Griffin 4 well uh, here and just compare those two. Okay, so here's, uh, here's the Chinook 1 well. So on the left-hand side, I've got a gamma ray plot. And you can see that uh, the low gamma ray here on the left-hand side going to higher gamma ray on the right. Um, what I've done is I've, I've put the elevation of this gamma ray log exactly the same as the elevation on this pressure elevation plot on the right-hand side. So you can literally look at a pressure point here, go across to the left and see which geology that pressure point relates to. So in this plot on the right, we've got basically across the, the horizontal axis, increasing pressure in PSI from left to right. And this is elevation relative to sea level. So you've got, you're going from minus 2.5 kilometers below sea level to 2.7 or so at the bottom of the plot. Um, and all the data on this plot is a combination of either MDT or wireline type pressure tests, which is a lot of these pink dots, or some of the pink dots that are hooked up with a black bar, those are the drill stem tests. And the way I plotted these ones up is the, the completed interval for the drill stem test or the packed off interval is this black bar. And then that connects to the recorder elevation or the pressure recorder elevation and that's plotted there. So I didn't, I didn't correct the pressure according to the fluid density or anything like that. I, I wanted to keep it as it is, so I don't impose that interpretation on the plot. You can decide for yourself if you believe that that fits on gradient or not, but you need to remember that that pressure point here, for example, comes from a completed interval here, and it's just filled up the drill string up to the point at which the recorder recorded that pressure elevation. So, so here at, Ch at Chinook 1, we've got an interesting situation where the geology is, first of all, we've got the Z-part formation, which is a reasonably good, good quality, high permeability reservoir. And you can see from the gamma ray here, the sands. And then it overlays, it overlaying that is the Berderong formation. And this is quite often thought to be uh, like a, a thief zone, almost like or a marginal quality reservoir at the top. And then we go into the Mardi Green sand and finally the Mudarong shale. So the combination of these two really form the regional seal that traps a lot of the big gas fields in the Northwest Shelf. Um, so we've got this interesting situation where you've got high permeability Z-PARD and you've got a much lower permeability Berderong. So already when we talk about that, we think about, well, is capillarity important to understanding uh, the pressures and distribution of fluids in this reservoir? So that's, so the interesting thing, what I've talked about before about that is we're going to look at some examples now from the field to see if the, how that pans out. So at this location, if we go from the bottom to the top, We've got this beautiful water gradient, 1.42. I've got this in PSI per meter, which is a strange mix of units that they use here. Uh, or that's equal to basically close to a freshwater hydrostatic gradient, 9.81 kPa per meter. So we've got a beautiful uh, water gradient up until this point here. And then we go through an inflection point and we go up through a small oil leg. Uh, 
slightly different gradient. This is uh, 51.9 API gravity uh, with a GOR of 2168 standard cubic feet per barrel. So we can, we've got enough information that we can kind of check this pressure gradient relative to this information from the fluids to see if that gradient makes sense to us or not, which, which is quite, quite handy. And then the intersection of those two gradients is what we'd pick off as the free water level for the Chinook one well. So that's this horizontal dashed line here. And then very close to the top of the Z-PARD, we move from the oil gradient into this gas gradient. And that gas gradient carry, carries up and includes this drill stem test that's up here. There's no gas up here it, the, because the completed interval is here, but the, the, the gas stops somewhere in this Marty Green sand uh, to wherever it gets to be a top seal. So we've got this quite a quite nice clean pressure depth profile where we can pick a free oil level, we can pick a free water level and all behaving very nicely. So that's an example of the Chinook one well. So let's look now at the Griffin field. Here's Griffin four. It's the same geology. So we've got the Z-PARD over top. We've got the Birdurong, this sort of thief zone at the top, and then Marty Green sand. And above that, we go into the Mudurong shale at the top, the regional top seal. And here again, we've got, and on this case, the, the log on the left, it's not a gamma ray log. It's actually a V shale log that I've plotted on there. So you can see, and the idea here is that you can, you can actually look at individual MDT or, or RFT uh, wireline pressure measurements, go across and see, do you believe that point or not? Is it likely to be a reasonable point or is it in a tight zone that might be supercharging or something like that? Anyway, it's just a bit of information there that you can see. Here, interestingly, we go through the Z-part formation, which is a high quality reservoir, through the water leg, and again, up an oil leg. And in this case, all the data above there is higher. So if I extend that oil gradient through the Birderong, nothing above there fits on that same oil gradient. So there, I mean, there could be some of this data might be a bit dodgy, but basically, you know, there's some stuff in here that is, is reasonably okay. And uh, this would give me the impression that whatever hydrocarbons through the Birderong here exist is it's kind of Apache saturation. And each one of those little bits of hydrocarbon is taking on its own pressure signature. It's not in communication or, or hydraulically connected to the main oil leg below. So that's quite a different situation than we had if I go back to the Chinook, where we've got this nicely behaved, even through all this tight bits of the, the reservoir here, this is pretty much just going to be a continuous gas saturation through that part of the reservoir. So quite, quite differently behaved in those two locations. Okay. So let's, let's now go back to um, these capillary pressure plots. So my question is, and my proposal would be, that perhaps the Z-PARD formation, the high quality reservoir, might be behaving something like this capillary pressure curve, and the Birderong might be behaving something like this capillary pressure curve. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to say, well, and, and one of the things I quite often do is I say, well, let's, let's just think about this thing in a really simple way to think about how the processes would be working. How are the different forces that are acting would behave? And in an ideal world, what would this thing look like? And then, and then you, if you've got that kind of straight in your mind, you can come back to the actual data and say, is this data telling me something about the underlying processes uh, that I think should be behaving, uh, should think should be operating. So let's, I'm gonna do a cartoon model now. So I'd like to think, you've, you've had a little example of what the, um, you know, what the Cindy and Chinook field looks like. And, and basically we've got a three, let's simplify this to a three layer reservoir. And here's a little cartoon on the left. So we've got this high quality reservoir in yellow. Then let's say it, it occurs something through here. Then we've got a little thief zone on top that would be equivalent to that Birderong, lower permeability reservoir. And finally, we go into the cap rock. And let's say it's in some kind of simple structure here. And, and let's say this thing has filled up with hydrocarbons at some stage. Well, so what I'd like to do is just walk you through what should the pressure profile look like at different well locations through this field and of course, in this cartoon example, I'm going to pick well locations 
at the absolute perfect location to understand the processes. Um, so what I'd like to do is, first of all, so this cartoon on the left, the elevation or the vertical axis on the cartoon on the left is exactly the same as the elevation on a pressure elevation plot on the right hand side. So what I'll plot up first is let's, oh, sorry, look at well number one in orange. If I had a vertical pressure profile through this field at well number one, I would, and here's my oil water contact, and here's the gas oil contact in red. So at well one, I can track those contacts across to the pressure elevation plot, and I would basically come up a water gradient through these pressure points until I reached the oil water contact or the free water level, and then I would go up an oil gradient until I reach the gas oil contact or the free oil level, and then I'd go up a steeper gas gradient. And because both of these contacts occur in high quality or high permeability reservoir, the difference between the threshold pressure and zero capillary pressure is hardly anything. So I'm it's going to be very difficult to distinguish the difference between the, free oil, the, the, the gas oil contact and the free oil level, or distinguish the difference between the oil water contact and the free water level. They're basically coincidence for what I can see on the, in, within the reservoir. So that's, that's the shape it would look. But you could imagine <clears throat> as oil started accumulating in this trap, before oil would penetrate into the lower permeability part of the reservoir, it would have to, if it's the non-wetting phase, it would have to overcome the threshold pressure of that lower part of the reservoir. So what would happen is, is we'd pile up a hydrocarbon column until the hydrocarbon column height relative to the water pressure gradient had a capillary pressure or a buoyancy pressure difference that was equal to the threshold pressure. Once that happened, then you would get a tendril of the non-wetting phase penetrating this lower permeability reservoir and you would start to fill this reservoir. Well, if I had well two located here, that would exactly intersect the area where I would observe this difference in the oil water contact compared to the free water level because the distance between the oil water contact here in the low permeability reservoir and the oil water contact out here in the high permeability reservoir, that column height should equal the threshold pressure to get into this low quality reservoir. So if I had data from well number two in green, and I plotted that on here. That would be the green points over top of the orange ones now. So I would follow the water gradient all the way up to the free water level, and the free water level would still be here at this horizontal blue dashed line. That would be at this point in this well. But, the, but above this, this is still 100% water saturation because I haven't yet got a column height enough to penetrate that low permeability reservoir through here. So, so I, if I had a pressure point exactly at this location below the oil water contact, it would be this green pressure point here, and it would still be on this water pressure gradient, all the way up to this point right below the oil water contact. And then if I move from immediately below the oil water contact to immediately above the oil water contact, I would jump from that point over to this point on the oil gradient. And that jump in pressure would be equal to the threshold pressure of the low permeability reservoir. And it would also be equal to this vertical distance between these two contact elevations, or the times the difference in density times the acceleration of gravity. So the physics of how that works translates to the reservoir like this, and it translates to the pressure elevation plot like this. So we end up with this odd little jump that hops you onto the, the oil pressure gradient. Now, once you're in the oil phase, everything within the static oil phase, doesn't matter where you are, has to fall on this common gradient. So if I thought three-dimensionally through the field, you'd see that I could go from here across horizontally and all the way down to here, that would have to fall on this oil pressure gradient through here. Well, and the exact same thing happens for the oil gas contact. For the gas to get into the low 
quality reservoir, it's got to overcome the displacement pressure. So this gas oil contact is going to be shifted a little bit off the gas oil contact in the high quality reservoir. So if I had well three in blue, I could plot that data. <clears throat> and that data would look like this. So in this case, I go through the oil water contact in the high permeability reservoir. So it does the same thing as the orange data, it comes up water gradient, shifts up onto the oil gradient. But now I stay on the oil gradient all the way to this point here, just below the gas oil contact. And when I go across that contact, I jump from this blue point over to the right onto the gas con uh, onto the gas gradient. And that difference in pressure is the threshold pressure for the gas phase to get into the low permeability reservoir if gas is the non-wetting phase. So I'm left with this interesting pattern on the pressure elevation plot. And it makes it kind of makes you think, okay, how often have you looked at pressure elevation plots? And you've got the odd point that doesn't quite fall on gradient. And you think, oh, yeah, it's just a data error. I shift that over there, and it makes a lot more sense. Well, my caution would be that if we think about, um, you can imagine, I mean, this is a very simplistic cartoon. The reality is that we've got a very complicated distribution of permeability in our reservoir. And that distribution is leading to all sorts of little bumps and wiggles in terms of what the capillary pressure is doing to get hydrocarbon in that pore space. And sometimes some of these small differences in your pressure elevation plot could actually be telling you something about the reservoir. And we need to think carefully about it before we just assume uh, it's a data entry error and we'll stick it back on and let's have a nice clean plot that makes sense to us uh, in a simple way. Okay, so all of this so far has been assuming that there's no dynamic flow within the formation water phase. And we know that that's almost never true. So even before we start producing the field, almost always there's some kind of difference in potential energy in the water phase. Well, let's come back to the Griffin Sindian uh, Chinook fields. So what I did with each one of these wells, so the map on the right is just a distribution of hydraulic head relative to sea level. So this entire thing is artesian. It goes, and for each one of these wells where I had a pressure value in the water leg, I calculated the hydraulic head. And it turns out, it goes from 50 at Griffin, 49 just below the Sindian field. And the lowest value is at Ramilly's down here at 35. So if you were allowed, if you allowed at Ramilly's, all that means is if you complete it in the water leg, the water would rise within the well bore to 35 meters above sea level. That's the hydraulic head there. And at Griffin 1, it would rise to 50 meters above sea level. So all this does is this maps out the potential energy within the formation water leg below the hydrocarbon phase. And because there's a change of potential energy, it means through the pore space that there's some fluid migration occurring. This entire offshore area is under compaction. Uh, uh, the entire thing is through through the you know burial and compaction is squeezing the pore space and dewatering, and that's what's driving this potential energy gradient. So you can imagine that it's squeezing fluids out from here to lower values and around out at the bottom end, and squeezing out to the north of Chinook too, and squeezing fluids to the south from the Sindian field. So so definitely we have different hydraulic head at different locations beneath this field. So let's just think about what the implications of that are. So let's come back to our idealized situation. I've just brought this circle in to just note, because the flow system here is out between these two faults, around the fault tip and back down this way, it's quite a long distance. So I could compare the hydraulic head at Griffin 3 here across to the other side, and there's a fairly big change of hydraulic head across that fault. But it's because the, the flow path is around the fault tip rather than through the fault per se. Okay, so let's come back to our idealized situation then. And I'm keeping everything exactly the same with the exception I'm adding in fluid flow from right to left across this diagram. All, and I've drawn this in a fairly extreme example just to demonstrate the impact on what we would be looking at. And, um, and what it does is it tilts the free water level in the direction of flow. So it means that because we've got lower hydraulic head on the left 
and higher energy, higher hydraulic head on the right, it just means that there's a change in the potential at the base of the hydrocarbon phase so that the free water level is at a different elevation as we move across there. The hydrocarbon phase is still static. Now you'll notice that even though this free water level is tilted, the boundary between, or the free oil level, the boundary between the oil and the gas phase is still horizontal because there's no dynamics occurring. This entire hydrocarbon phase is statically trapped. So the only dynamics is happening is between the oil and the, and the, and the water below that. Okay, so let's go back to our well number one. So again, you can track horizontally what's happening on the cartoon on the left to the fluid pressure distribution on the right. Remember, it's increasing pressure on the horizontal axis and elevation is going down the well vertically. So what we have is water pressure gradient coming up here. We have the inflection point through the oil that's equal to the oil water contact there. And we move up the gas pressure gradient in this part of the well to the top of the reservoir. If we move over to well number two, much lower hydraulic head at that area there. And we're also dealing with this issue of capillarity shifting the oil water contact up off the well there. So let's just take a look at that. If I put the green data on for that well, well, the first thing is, is that the water pressure gradients no longer overlap on each other because we're going from high, hydro high hydraulic head on the orange data to lower hydraulic head on the green data. So that's we're, because we're down flow here. So now we've got the water pressure gradient on this uh, green data here. Uh, we go through the free water level at this location. So if we extend the oil water contact down, it would intersect this water gradient at that location there, which is equal to this point on this tilted free water level. But it's not, there's no oil there because we have to overcome the displacement pressure or the with this lower part of the reservoir. So we have to actually come up to this point, the oil water contact, jump onto the oil gradient, and then move up the oil gradient, and finally up the gas gradient. And then finally, we could look at well number three. So here we've got a water pressure gradient between the other two. So this would be the gradient here. We move up the oil because we're in the oil phase in the high quality reservoir. But we stay on that oil phase all the way to this contact here. That's displaced because of capillarity, and we hop onto the gas pressure gradient. So even in this simple cartoon scenario, with just fluid dynamics, buoyancy, and capillary on a very simple system, we end up, in theory, with this complicated pressure elevation plot. And every one of the aspects of the deviations off a very simple set of three gradients is telling us something about the physics of how this reservoir is behaving in the multi-phase flow situation. So again, I'd say, you know, all these slight differences in the pressure elevation plot distribution or your MDT data and drill stem test data, it's really worth thinking about if, if you're looking at a, uh, something that's a data error or you're looking at something that's telling you something about the rocks and the fluids. So, so this would be the totally idealized situation if you had the perfect wells in the perfect locations with this very simple conceptual model of how things are working. So let's now, the last part of the seminar is to come back to Griffin, Cindy, and Chinook and kind of try to wrap it up. So again, the key things are here that we've got separate fields for the Chinook Sindian. It's got an oil rim, it's got two gas caps, and the gas caps have different oil gas uh, uh, levels. We've got a completely separate oil field for Griffin that spills around this, uh, spills around this fault. <coughs> and we've got a distribution of hydraulic head at the base of the hydrocarbon phase. What I'd like to do now is take a look at the Ramillies one well. Why this is interesting is because it is all the way around on the flow path, all the way down here. It's the lowest hydraulic head in the water system at the base of this otherwise continuous hydrocarbon oil phase. So here's the V shale on the left-hand side uh, for Ramillies one, and you can see the same geology, the Z-PARD high permeability reservoir, 
Birdurong, thief zone above, lower permeability, and then we've got the seal somewhere between the Marty Greenstand and the Mugrong above. What's interesting here is through the entire ZPIRD, the MDT data fall on a water pressure gradient, and we can extend that up somewhere here. At this location in the Birdurong is a drill stem test that gave us a really good oil recovery, even though it's, it's a marginal quality reservoir. The completed interval is here in the black, and then we've got a bit more MDT data up towards the top. So we've got, I guess the thing is with this DST is it's from a pretty big interval, but the, the data plots here. And what's interesting is that we know it's oil. We've got the specific gravity. Uh, we've got the GOR, and it makes sense to use this gradient that's similar to the oil gradient for the rest of the field. If we use that gradient through that point, and we extrapolate that gradient down, we get a free water level here at minus 2738. And yet we go up through water saturated rock. But interestingly, somewhere is up here, if we think about capillarity and the fact that the hydrocarbons in the Birderong phase rather than the Z-PARD, we jump from here to here, which is 24 PSI or 165 kPa. And interestingly, that is not a bad match to if you took a chunk of Birderong reservoir and ran it through a mercury injection a porosimeter test, what you would get for the threshold pressure for this hydrocarbon phase for that rock. So my suggestion would be is that this is a case where we're seeing exactly this jump in pressure onto the oil pressure gradient uh, as we come through this part of the reservoir. Okay, well, let's put, oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out is that this free water level down at Ramillies 1 is about 40 meters lower than the equivalent free water level at Griffin 4 around the other side of the fault where there's much higher hydraulic head in the water lake. So tilted contact, and we're also seeing the impact of capillary on this Birderong uh, formation here. Okay, so the last little bit, other things to consider. Um, now I've plotted all the data from all the wells onto a single pressure elevation plot. So there's a couple interesting things. Of course, there's a lot of scat scatter because there's some interesting things happening with individual wells. But basically what we see is a water gradient down the bottom with a contact between the water and the Griffin oil phase, and then a big oil column for Griffin that goes up like this. And that's all the different Griffin, eight different Griffin wells. And if we looked in detail, some of these water, we'd use some different water values to estimate where this free water level would be at different locations beneath the field. But all the, all the oil data more or less falls on this one gradient for the whole field. If we compare that to the Chinook Sindian, we've got a water gradient that extends up here on the blue line and then to, it's the left hand side of the plot here here's a little oil leg and the different fields plot on the same oil leg and then we've got two gas columns that are slightly different between the two but they're very close that come up like this so the interesting thing is is that if we extend kind of a water gradient from that region there out and we extend the Chinook gradient and the Griffin gradient up, it kind of comes to a common displacement pressure, total cap pressure across these two. So you wonder, well, is there some fault, probably fault seal capacity that's a membrane seal controlling these two fields? And let if we think about that hydrocarbon fill history. And if these, you know, the thought that these two fields were originally connected, probably, what if it originally got filled with oil and this contact instead of being here was a lot deeper um, and these two fields were connected and it probably leaked back to some fault seal threshold pressure that limited the field height to something like this. And then later on, you had a gas charge that only accessed Chinook Sindian. So then we fill the gas cap up on this kind of gradient rather than an oil gradient and displaced, and basically we lost the oil out of the trap. So we're left with this same total threshold pressure being taken up by a gas column this high and a small oil leg uh, 
compared to Griffin, where that same, you know, threshold pressure is taken up by a huge oil leg. So we believe, you know, we're starting to think that there's some story here in terms of an ultimate fault seal capacity that's controlled these two fields. Um, and we've got these very different geometries now because of a function of the late gas charge and the fact that this thing's being controlled by some sort of a, a capillary fault seal. So that's an interesting sort of uh, tie together of the thing at the end. So that's more or less bringing us to the end of the presentation. I appreciate your attention that for those of you that stuck with me here. Um, the takeaway messages, I guess, are the difference in the free water level and the oil water contact is equal to the threshold pressure. So anytime you've got some um, capillary pressure information, you can, it's not a mystery. You, the minute you know that you've got a permeability difference and that there's a threshold pressure to get the non-wetting phase in, it's telling you something, what you could expect, how it should be behaving in the reservoir. And this pattern is complicated. If you've got dynamic sort of environment in your, res in your reservoir below, in the aquifer part of the reservoir below, this could lead to a tilt to the contact to some degree or another. And I guess it's the, the thing is, is you don't necessarily dismiss pressure points off gradient on a PE plot as being erroneous. Maybe they are, but they may also be telling you something important. And, you know, I guess the why should I care part is saying, well, the detailed geometry of trapped hydrocarbon pools are determined by primarily by a combination of buoyancy, capillary and hydrodynamic forces in some very complicated distribution of permeability. And if you don't consider all three, you might miss something and potentially something important. Um, so with that, I've got a, just a couple references here again for you if you're interested in reading a bit more. Uh, these are some things that I thought were really, really useful papers. This final paper is my paper from 2005 that's the details of the Griffin field analysis that we've talked about. That's in Geofluids Journal. <coughs> if, you're, if you're interested, please take a look at any of those. And, um, and I, think, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Um, if you want to hang out and uh, ask a question, be more than happy to try and address questions if they come in. But um, look, it's getting, you know, uh, fairly late in Australia, and I appreciate you guys taking time to, to listen. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. It was an excellent presentation, uh, very informative. And uh, we have actually some questions here uh, for you. I know it's late at night and you want to go right to the bed, but uh, let, let's no, take three okay. questions and uh, we close the session. So uh, the first question is that do transition zone exist in natural, naturally fractured reservoirs as well? Ah, yeah, of course. So, so the interesting thing there is that the, the fracture zone is just another part of the permeability distribution, right? So, and it depends, of course, if your fractures are connected fractures or if you've got isolated fractures within a rock matrix. Um, if you've got a connected fracture system that extends down into the water leg, it's, it's got a completely different permeability pathway than the host rock around those fractures. So I've, you know, I've worked in some, well, in particular, some Triassic reservoirs in Canada where it becomes very difficult to produce because if you've got some fractures that extend down into the, the water leg, you put a pressure differential on and you pull the water straight up. So it would absolutely impact how you, how the physics of how the fluids would move in that system. So yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So the next question, uh is an interesting one. Can we measure uh, capillary pressure in the field, in, in downhole, rather than in the lab? That's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, not, well, I'm gonna have to think about that one a little bit uh, before I rashly jump to, I'm off the top of my head, I don't remember a methodology where you can do that. Um, I, basically, it comes back to what you need to understand to get, get the capillary pressures is understanding what the permeability contrast is and what the fluid physics are. So, I mean, usually we have some idea about the fluid physics, so density, um, uh, and we can guess, you know, you can guess at the wettability. 
uh, if you don't have any data, or you can test a number of scenarios for different assumptions of wettability. Um, uh, and really then it becomes, you know, how well do you know the distribution of permeability? And of course, that's always the Achilles heel of any, that's why all, you know, that's why so many geophysicists, geologists still have jobs is because we don't understand permeability very well. Uh, it keeps us all employed. But um, off the top of my head, I'm not aware of uh, a way of physically measuring capillarity in situ. Um, I'd have to think about that and get back to you though. Oh, no worries. The, the next question uh, is more about the fluid behavior in, 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 in nanopores, in, in shale and kerogen. Uh, I mean, do you have any explanation about that? Um, sure, sure. So the, the tricky thing is, is when we, when we move from more conventional reservoirs to unconventional reservoirs, where you get to very extremely low permeability, the, the Really, the, it's not that the physics changes a huge amount. It's just that we get to the point at which the assumptions that we use for uh, understanding fluid flow in terms of a Darcy flow no longer are valid. So it means that other, other forces become, you know, what we can normally assume are irrelevant suddenly become important. So you get into this space where... Um, it, even though, um, even though the physics hasn't changed in terms of um, capillarity, pressure distributions, and buoyancy, the, the problem is, is that there's other forces that have become even more important. So you can't just assume that they're negligible anymore. So, so basically, you're in the space where you need to consider more physical phenomena than you would normally in a uh, in even just a low permeability but classic or sort of uh, classic reservoir conventional reservoir so you know that's i guess i don't know if that answers the question or not but um is we need to consider more things to understand the total fluid behavior thank you jim and, and there's one one more small question and then uh, i think we don't have any any other question we can close the session so uh the question is that why APIs from DST and RFT are different. It's probably referring to one of your plots that you showed. Ah, sure, sure, sure. So um, I think the thing is, is if it would have been multiple DSTs, it'd be probably slightly different APIs for the DSTs as well. Um, look, the, I guess the thing is, is that the depending on where you're sampling the hydrocarbon from within the total hydrocarbon column, the detailed composition is going to change, um, and and you'll you know. In order to sort of work that one out, you need to look at all your API data, where it fits vertically relative to each other, and, and use, and I often use that information uh, together with the pressure temperature um, um, to, to work out if, if the pressure data is telling me that the fluid phase is connected, does the chemistry data agree with that? Or is the chemistry data telling me there's some sort of a barrier in the system and it's actually two, potentially two hydrocarbon phases. So I didn't spend very much time uh, discussing the details around that chemistry distribution, but uh, you know, um, off, it, it's not surprising that it would be different at different locations, I guess. Okay, Jim, uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your time and knowledge with us and uh, specifically your uh, flexibility with time. Uh, I would like to also appreciate all the attendees uh, uh, for basically participation in the meeting. Uh, don't forget our next talk is on Friday, 10th of July, and is about uh, seismicity. So with that said, I would like to wish all of you good uh, day or night and uh, see you again on, on Friday. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jim.